Hey Sunny, thanks for sending me your code. Uh, I've got your GitHub page open. I already cloned the repo to my machine and I've already have it open here in my editor. Um, I really like that you have a readme file that just explains how to set up some of these dependencies in requirements.txt because I know that it's a little bit challenging sometimes to get LXML work, uh, especially depending on the platform. Um, but uh, I was actually able to get this to run and install all of the dependencies. I didn't go with the um, the step here where I think this compiles it from scratch, but I, I'm using Homebrew as my package manager on macOS. And I was able to just go uh, brew install libxslt and something else that I don't remember. I'm, I'm just gonna send you that in a, in a comment. Uh, so potentially that would be an easier way for people on Mac to get this to run. Uh, but in any case, that, that was really helpful. I really like uh, that you have this here. I also like the fact that you have a proper license file, which I think is just good practice for any open source um, project. Your requirements TXT looks good. It looks like that's actually also the stuff that we're really using. Um, they're all uh, all the dependencies are pinned to specific versions, which is something that I think is really good because um, if you know if someone were to not do that, then uh, we could easily get into a situation where people install this at different times and they end up with completely different requirements, which just blow up. So it's great that that you have those. Um, yeah. So what's interesting about your project is that it's a little bit larger than the uh, project that I've that I've uh, the projects that I've reviewed before for this. Um, code review series. So we're just going to see, you know, how, how much I can cram in um, before it just turns into a super long video that no one's going to watch. All right, I've got all the dependencies ready and I just want to make sure I can actually run this locally. All right, so auction results.py. Let's run this. Okay, it's doing something and then it blows up with a connection error, connection refused. And um, we can see here that this is because I don't have an SMTP server set up locally that's going to send email. So with this stuff, um, I think what you could do, you know, maybe have something like a special flag, like dash dash dry run that you check in here. And if that's set, um, instead of actually trying to send an email, we're just going to print print out that message so that someone who wants to run this doesn't have to actually set up an email server um, to send emails. And I think something like that is eventually also going to be helpful when we're getting into writing some tests for this. Because you mentioned in the, the email you wrote me that um, you want to start testing this code base, um, writing some unit tests for it, which I think would be a great next step. And um, eventually, you know, we're going to need something like that where we either either stub out or mock out that email sending thing. Uh, one more word of warning. Uh, this is probably something you want to look into. So the smtplib.smtp, it doesn't use an encrypted connection by default. And I know there is, I think, an SMTP underscore SSL, or I don't know how, you know, if it's uppercase or lowercase, but uh, essentially that one, the other one is is encrypted, this one isn't. So this might be okay if you're just connecting to localhost, but um, could be something to look into. If you ever want to run this and talk to a remote email server, definitely look into the, the encrypted uh, connection here. Okay, what I like is that you're using this pattern here to kind of factor out a main uh, function instead of just throwing it into a script, but um, kind of making sure that uh, this is separated out. And I really like that. Um, just, you know, one thing that's, that's really jumping out at me right now is that this main function um, has these different faces here, right? Like we're loading the config file, we're initializing a bunch of settings and then we have this for loop and we do a bunch of stuff here, uh, including the email sending send results where, where I would be thinking, what if you would actually factor this out, like pull it out into separate functions. And then you would end up with, you know, something like this, um, where, where you could say, okay, we have a function to load the config. Then we have a function for uh, scraping the results, you know, on some specific side or whatever. Like this is not actually like real code, this is more pseudo code. But what would happen is that 
um, instead of having this relatively long main function, you can actually pull out these parts and then that will give you the power to test them separately. So maybe to demonstrate that, I actually wanna do this refactoring with uh, the load config function. Um, because I, th I think that could have the benefit for you also where in the future, you know, you're probably gonna need something like that repeatedly, right? Like eventually you're, you're gonna work on another project, it's gonna need some kind of uh, config file parsing. And if, if you've already settled on YAML for that, which I think is a good choice, then uh, you're probably gonna wanna reuse something like that. So I think it pays in the long run to actually write these little functions so that you almost have your own library of things you can reuse and all of these bricks you can use, reuse to build new programs. So um, yeah, so like I said, you know, we're gonna refactor this thing a bit and then see how that works out. So um, I'm, I'm just pulling this out into a different file here. And now I think what's interesting is that um, it, it gives, uh, or that that piece of code, it actually has the config file hard-coded. I would probably change that so that it takes um, a file name. And then the next thing, so okay, so this is completely random because I actually worked with this. Um, you wanna look into the YAML library and the load function because there's also a safe load um, that's probably gonna be the better choice in this case. So kind of the, the problem with yaml.load is that it's it's relatively insecure. So uh, this is similar to the, the pickle module in the standard library, which uh, basically has the power to execute arbitrary Python code. And that's fine if you completely control the, the input here, let's say the config file, you know, if that's always just loaded locally, you write it, you, you're 100% sure there's no malicious um, contents in there, then using dot .load is totally fine. However, if this piece of code at some point ends up, you know, in another project gets copied and pasted around, I've actually seen this happen um, at a client where I worked, where um, there was a very insecure YAML dot .load in production with user data. And uh, luckily no one exploited it, but it could have been, you know, very, very easy to do that. Um, so yeah, my recommendation would here would be definitely use the safe load, even if it's not giving you a huge security benefit right now, but um, it's just gonna keep you a lot safer in the future. Okay, so now this uh, parses out the config file, right? So because now this is a function, I would just say, all right, it's gonna return a, um, uh, the actual config dictionary, right? And then here we could just say config equals load config. Um, and I believe it was config.yaml, right? And I can actually drop this comment here. Well, A, because we've just completed it and B, now I don't need a comment that says load the config because um, the function is called load the config, right? So I'm giving more um, explicit names to everything, which which personally I think that's a good thing. So the next thing here is, uh, A, first of all, I think it's great that you're actually checking for errors here. I think that's good. Um, what I would try and do is to actually give a little bit more output here with the, uh, you know, what, what actually went wrong. So when I'm going config YAML and we're just gonna move that to, uh, rename that to config uh, back. All right, so now that, that file that we wanna load is gone. So if I try and run that program again, it's gonna say fail to read config.yaml, but we don't know why, right? I could have also edited the config file and introduced um, some kind of syntax error and then I would get the same error. So what you can do here is you can just hold on to that exception and then do something like this where we're just gonna tack on the exception message. And now if I trigger the same run, I actually get this, this error message here that tells me no such file or directory config.yaml, um, which I think is a little bit more helpful. So let's undo that. Sure, it still works. 
yeah, so I would look into that. Okay, so now the next challenge is that because here we're actually, we've turned this into a function. I'm not sure if this should have the power to exit the whole program um, by itself, right? Because if you imagine you wanted to test this load config function, a challenge with that would be that uh, you don't want to exit the program all the time. And there are ways to prevent that from happening, but then you you know you really have to kind of dig around in the innards of Python and, and kind of monkey patch some stuff to, to prevent that from happening, which is, in my opinion, not the best way to go about it. So I think what this function should do is uh, we want to maybe define a new uh, exception class. So we can just say um, invalid config. And it's just based on exception. And that class doesn't even have to do anything, really. But um, what, what we're going to do now is instead of triggering an exit, we're just going to say, okay, throw this error with the message we were using before. And then, you know, it's already pretty clear what's happening. Like, I don't have to comment this heavily. I don't have to pass around some kind of string. It's just, yeah, I get an exception and I know what happened. So, okay, so I actually gotta, gotta do, like, break the config again and then run this again. All right, see? So now already this is getting more and more explicit, right? And now we're getting this invalid config, fail to read config YAML, uh, no such file directory config YAML. And I'm actually just noticing that we've got the the name of the config file hard-coded here as well, which now isn't even true anymore. So um, I would probably actually just change this. So that uh, the error we get in the end is going to be invalid config, no such file directory config YAML. Um, and I think that is cleaner or actually clearer to see what's going on. Now, the thing is like that I actually changed the behavior of your program. In my opinion, it would actually be fine um, to do something like this where you just let it die with a with an exception and then you get the full stack trace and we know what happened. I think it's very, it's verbose enough to for people to figure out what's going on. But to actually make sure it, it behaves the same way as, as you had it before, I would do this, um, invalid config. And then we could still say uh, exit, like we would probably want to print it and do an exit one. So now we get exactly the same behavior. We would lose the stack trace. So, you know, arguably that isn't the greatest, uh, the greatest results here. We probably want to make this a little bit more explicit. So something like that, I think, emulates fairly closely uh, what you had had earlier. Um, and then here, instead of doing the exit, again, I think main shouldn't really have the power to trigger an exit by itself. But what it should do, and you know, this is a minor point, I just like to do that. What if you just returned the error code? You know, then it becomes kind of uh, uh, very C-like <laughs> where uh, you're returning the actual error code and um, at the end, we're just going to call exit on the uh, the return code here. Okay, so let's copy that back. Make sure everything still works. At the end, I'm not actually sure what happens when you call exit none. So just to make sure, we're probably going to need to return a zero just to make sure um, this is still behaves the same. But then, so the, why, the reason why I made this change is then um, if you're going to write tests for this eventually, you can actually test this whole main function. And it's not going to exit the program. It's just going to give you a return code that you can then test for in a test case or check for in a test case. And uh, that will give you the power really to, to um, also reuse this in, in, diff in different programs and in different uh, scenarios. And so I think this is a change for the better. So I'm not going to do, you know, 
similar things with uh, this other stuff. I think would be really easy for the um, the email sending part. But I think the general technique that I've applied, you could use that and use it in other parts of the code as well, right? Like here, for example, we're loading the sample file. Um, again, you know, this would be an opportunity for you to turn that into a constant, maybe use it in a, in a separate um, function and so on. So I think that would clean it up a little bit. I mean, there's, you know, this is super nitpicky. Uh, this is really pep eight because the lines are too long, but you know, maybe you're using a different setting. Like the one reason why I like keeping my lines at um, 79 characters or kind of the pep eight recommendations is that in GitHub code reviews, it's just so much easier to have two files side by side without having to scroll um, horizontally. And I feel like it just makes it so much easier if you're working with a team, so much easier to review each other's code if if there's just no opportunity for you, for people to scroll horizontally because it's just it makes it so much harder to line them line up the files and actually get an understanding of what's going on at the same time. Um, but yeah, like I said, this is super nitpicky, and um, in general, I think your code is formatted formatted well you know it's it uses consistent formatting it uses uh consistent spaces for everything and i i really like that um okay so i'm gonna try and like speed this up a little bit because i don't have too much more time um so here with this thing um initialize global settings hmm i'm I mean, I understand why you're doing it, but I think you would be better off actually rewriting this at some point so that um, you're not just reaching in into this um, auction suburb suburb class and setting these things, but instead you're passing it in every time you create um, a suburb object, I believe, right? Um, so right now what happens is like we're reaching in, actually changing this this attribute here. And I would try and change that so that you're actually passing this in uh, as a a uh, different argument to the dunder init method, because then again, uh, again, it becomes easier to test this piece of code, right? Where now um, you would have to make sure that every single test overrides the settings, uh, the changes that the previous test made. And this, all of this housekeeping just makes it a lot harder to write tests. Uh, but if you changed it so that you would just create a suburb object and every t single time you just pass it in that base URL, you know, which isn't all that much work, then you can be sure that every suburb object is actually independent and doesn't have these global settings. So I would probably change that. Okay, yeah, I think I mentioned that before. You could do something similar here with the sample sample data. Uh, I would probably also extract these guys here to just to be constants. I'm not sure if they should be in line, you know, probably just have these as constants up there and then uh, set them. Um, mm, 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 mm. Instead of having them as plain strings here. Uh, I like the fact that you're writing comments and yeah, like I said earlier, you know, if you if you refactor this a bit, you could actually, in my opinion, get rid of these comments because the code is going to speak for itself, right? The load config part here is actually going to tell us exactly what's going on. Um, mm -mm -mm. Okay, my suburb. Yeah, this is a bit of inconsistent formatting. I guess like in Python, you would always, you know, do this. Um, let's leave that for now. Like you're, you're changing the... Um, the casing style but yeah that's that's not too horrible okay okay so let's actually look into the suburb module real quick again okay this looks pretty sensible so far Okay, so a couple of random things. Um, you're switching quote styles, which that's like another super nitpicky thing that I bring up all the time, but I really like them to be, um, you know, consistent. Um, for, yeah, actually, why? I don't know. I just like things to be consistent because it otherwise I 
I my OCD kicks in and I, I just get this like okay why why is this formatted differently? Um, if I want to search for for all the strings in a in a file, you know, it's, it becomes harder to write the the right regex to do that and all these things. So yeah, for some reason I'm just a stickler for making that consistent. Um, yeah. Okay. So there are a couple of things and this is actually being called out by the linter as well so i'm seeing that you're you're doing this right where you're going if none equals equals separator and so i'm thinking you're probably doing it in this order uh to avoid like isn't this like some kind of c trick to avoid turning a comparison into an assignment like if you had if x equals equals null right and then we're doing something and then that could accidentally turn into x equals null and then you would this would always be true and it would be a huge bug essentially and if you're flipping this around null equals equals x then if if the same mistake happens it's a compiler error because you can't assign to null so i i think that's where it comes from um now the idea behind that is actually really good because um the same thing could happen to you in python right like you could be like separator equals equals none and then accidentally do this and then you're going to end up with uh, an assignment which i'm actually not sure if this is is this valid python let's see um mm -mm -mm. Okay, yeah. So you can't actually do that in Python. But the idea is good, right? Like you're you're thinking of, of stuff like that, which, which is something that I really like. So actually the recommend recommendation in Python would be to um to not even use the uh equals equals comparison. Um and this is being called out by the linter as well, right? So flake eight tells me comparison to none should be if condition is none. Um so you want something like if separator is none and the reason for that is um, with equals equals you're checking for equality and that will depend on how that object or the object you're you're implementing how they are at uh, the object you're comparing how they are implemented so you're you're not you know some of them might actually say hey yeah i'm equal to none because i'm empty or whatever but you don't want that um, usually what you want is an is comparison which checks for identity so in this case none is like a global singleton there's there can only ever be one none object in uh, in a python process and um, therefore if you're using the is comparison you're on the safe side because then you know you, you also can't accidentally change that to an assignment i mean we just established that that wouldn't even work but um this is the way you would compare to none and you wouldn't uh, use the the equals equals comparison right and it would be the same here um, where you would just use is not none and um, this is interesting because again I think it really shows how powerful uh, a good linter like flake, flake 8 is uh, where it actually calls out these things right and tells you about them so i think again you would really benefit from from actually running uh flake 8 over your your code um just to maybe demonstrate that really quickly how you would go about that just install flake 8 by running pip install flake 8 and then we could just run that on the auction module and we should get yeah should get a bunch of messages here where we're comparing to none. Um, and, and this seems like it's happening quite a bit. So, you know, maybe you wanna look into that and actually just train yourself to use is uh, to avoid these comparisons. Um, but overall, um, it's looking pretty good. I like that you're breaking up these. Um, yep, yeah, that would work. I mean, again here, you know, I would change the quote style on all of them just to make them consistent, but I'm, you know, I'm not gonna be, trying not to be so nitpicky. Uh, this is a bit weird. So we're creating this feature dictionary and then setting it to the empty dictionary. Not entirely sure why we would do that. Uh, 
Yeah, I think I've seen that a couple of times where you're computing the hash of something. Again, that could be its own function. I think it would be totally fine if that was its own function, right? It's up here as well where we're doing the SHA-1. Um, I mean, here you're passing an image, but with all of this stuff, maybe it makes sense to actually extract this um, because then it makes it really easy to, to change the hash function globally, for example. Mm. Yeah, okay, so I think my general comment here would be that maybe again, this is doing, this object is doing a bit much. Like, so my main feedback essentially here would be that this seems to be doing um, some parsing and scraping, right? We're running a beautiful soup on this thing. Now, what this also does is, is actually it creates these uh, emails that we're going to send. And again, I think you could come up with a structure where these are separate concerns, right? So you have like a subverb parser object that is only concerned with parsing out um, some HTML that you hand it. Um, and then you would have a subverb message, suburb report generator or something like that, that could take a parsed suburb and then based on that actually generate that report or maybe it would take multiple suburbs. Like essentially you, you could split up these two concerns of parsing the HTML and um, generating the report. I think I would probably split those apart. Again, that's gonna help you with testing. And we're gonna get to that in a minute. Um, and I think it would make your code a little bit cleaner. And then also, you know, these classes would be, if you split that in two, they would be half as big, which I think would be good in terms of maintainability. And like I said, for writing tests and just understanding what's going on. So I think this would be helpful. I don't wanna to go too deeply into this, but um, what I wanna do is um, I wanna get a little bit into testing just because you mentioned it. And um, so we're gonna do that in a minute. All right, so one more thing I wanted to dig into is uh, just give you, you know, a very uh, simple setup for running tests so you can get started on writing tests because that's some, something you actually mentioned in your email. So um, I like using PyTest, which is kind of, um, yeah, it's a Python testing tool. Uh, it's kind of an alternative to just using the built-in uh, unit test way of structuring your tests. Uh, it has, it requires a little less boilerplate code, which I think is good. I really like simplicity. And um, it is also a very good test runner that will find your tests automatically. So you don't really have to worry about um, running them manually, writing scripts to do that. So I'm a huge fan of PyTest and I just wanna show you how to set it, uh, you know, how to set it up and how it all works. So all we need to do really is we need to pip install PyTest what I want to do is I want to write a little test for um, this load config file with the refactoring we did earlier. So what I would probably do is just create a new file that we're going to call uh, test config. Let's call this, what should we call the module? Uh, config parsing. Uh, pi. just want to make sure this actually works. So what I would usually do first is have a failing test so I can uh, make sure we're actually running the tests. And then once I have something that fails, I can add to that and, and kind of work towards uh, where we have a, a test, a suite of tests that actually tests something. So what I need to do here, and you might not have to do this, is uh, I need to ignore my virtual environment so that PyTest only finds the test that's actually relevant to us. Um, All right, so now to run this test, um, just gonna go pytest dash dash ignore equals vnv because I need to tell it to ignore the uh, virtual environment folder because otherwise it's just gonna find uh, a crazy amount of files to test that are really irrelevant to uh, our project here, your project here. Okay, so this is running. It found the test config parsing and uh, it actually, the test failed, right? Just like we wanted it. Um, so now we know this works. So in order to test this, I think this could actually be its own module. So what I would probably do here now is create a new um, 
module. I'm just going to call config parsing pi. I'm just going to dump all of that in here and can get rid of the YAML stuff, I think, as well. Then I would say from config parsing import load config and invalid config using YAML anywhere? No. Okay, so now <laughs> let's make sure your program um, still works. Which is, you know, if we had a proper test suite, then we would just run tests and hopefully that would give us a good idea if everything's still working. Um, okay. All right. So now in the test config parsing, we're essentially going to do the same, right? We're just going to import that. And now we can start writing our tests. So I think a good test would be to... Um, to try and parse a simple YAML file. Well, actually, let's try and make sure um, if we give it a file that doesn't exist, it's not going to work. So test missing config. And you always want to start your... So essentially how the PyTest runner works is that it loads all the modules that start with test underscore and then finds all the functions that start with test underscore in those modules and then runs them as test cases. And uh, the way you're, you're uh, testing conditions in tests, you just use the built-in assert statement. And then PyTest is, is essentially going to do some magic to... Um, give you really nice error messages for these tests. So in this case, I would just say load config. Um, mm, 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 mm. Does not exist YAML, right? And hopefully that doesn't exist. So now the thing is with that is because um, that function now raises an exception, an invalid config exception. We got to make sure that um, this exception, um, we expect this exception to come out, right? So there's actually a helper in PyTest to do that, where we can say, with PyTest raises invalid config, and then it, that's our test case. So when we run this, it passes. And uh, what this helper statement makes makes sure is that it actually, you know, we, we throw like this load config function actually throws a invalid config um, exception. So if, if I change that to just return 42, we should get an error that we're not calling an exception, right? Did not raise invalid config. That way we can be sure we're actually testing the right thing. All right, so the next test I wanna write is um, one where we actually try and parse out a valid config file. So we're just gonna call this test valid config. I'll we'll keep it th simple. So now the challenge with that is when you look at uh, this load config module, it actually uses open to parse out a file from the file system. And um, this stuff is always a little bit hard to test, but uh, I also really like PyTest because it has some support for that kind of situation with uh, its fixtures mechanism. And so the way this works is, and this is going to seem a bit magical, which is, um, well, I think that's a bit unfortunate, but on the other hand, I think it's really powerful. So maybe just bear with me and see if that, you know, feels right to you. I think it, in this case, it would be a really good way to test this piece of code. Um, so what you need to do is just tell PyTest to give you a temporary directory fixture. And that just works by giving it um, a temp dir uh, argument. And then magically, PyTest is going to give you a temporary di directory to work with that. So we can just say, okay, the temp config is um, something that we create in this directory. Right, we're just going to create a new file here, temporary file. And then we can actually write stuff 
into this file, right? Text. So we can just say um, something, right? Let's just say hello, yes. And then we also need to pass an encoding. I'm just going to go with UTF-8 here. And now what you can do is you can call stir path. Or you can take the stir path of that config file or that temporary file. And this is actually going to be um, the a real path that then open can work with and, and read the contents that we just wrote to that file. So we could actually say uh, parsed config equals load config, give it that path. And then we can do a bunch of assertions, right? We could say parse config, hello, should be equal to true. And it actually worked, right? Because the YAML thing is going to convert the yes to true. And, you know, just to make sure this it's actually is making sense. Let's actually get this to fail. So that's one thing I um, I always try to do, break the test before you're moving on, because otherwise you're not going to know if it's really actually testing the thing that you want to test. Um, yeah, so in this case, we're, we're getting an assertion failure here. And uh, I think this looks pretty good. I mean, we could go, we could go crazy with this and... Um, you know, make this more complicated, which maybe is worth it. It's a good question. You know, like we could, we could actually change the contents here, make that a little bit more complicated. Um, um, right. Like if we wanted to do something like this, we could do that. Oh, wait, let's do it like this. I could say, okay, hello, yes. A number 42. And then we're going to write that out to a file. And then we could say, okay, hello is true. Yeah, let's just, you know, make sure it actually fails. Uh, bu, 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 bu. Okay, is this a tuple? Oh yeah, never mind. <laughs> we don't don't need that. Okay, so we could run this. Okay, and then we we can have a little bit more uh, complicated tests. So yeah, so this should still work. Okay, so this is looking pretty happy. And then we you can pass dash v for verbose mode, and then you can actually see um, a little bit more closely what's going on here. Okay, and so now that we have our test for a uh, valid config file, I would actually do the same thing, but for an invalid file. And uh, let's move that up here for super consistency. So all the bad tests are <laughs> in one section and the good tests are below that. So um, here, let's try and come up with a way to actually have an invalid YAML file. Um, I don't know, let's just put a bunch of percentage characters here um, and now what I would expect to happen there is is uh, this to actually throw an exception so let's just run this okay and we're getting a crazy YAML scanner error here and um, there is actually I think there's like a base class for all of the YAML errors, right? Which is called YAML error. So I think what we want to do, because we, we actually found a problem with load config here as well, where right now this is just looking at OS error and IO error, um, that this should also handle other YAML errors that we weren't really handling before. So now when I run this again, it's throwing an invalid config exception. And then uh, PyTest races, I can do the exact same uh, pattern here <laughs> there we go and oh wait what did I screw up now oh okay I'm missing 
closing braces. Okay, so now we're again we're checking for an invalid config um, exception. Yep, we're doing this. So now I think this is looking pretty good. This is not you know by any means exhaustive yet, but I think for a program a program or a tool like that um, like we have here, it's actually um, pretty good test suite, you know, just for this little function. Um, yeah, I guess probably what, what you're thinking now is like, oh man, this is going to take a lot of work to write all these tests. Um, yes. On the other hand, they're also going to uncover a lot of edge cases and stuff that, um, you know, like going into this, I, I didn't realize like we were actually missing uh, that, that piece here where we're checking for YAML error. And this might not actually be, you know, it might not make sense to spend that much time if it's just a simple script or a, a small program that like you have here. But um, just having the ability to, to write these tests and then uh, kind of building on, top, building on top of them, I think makes this whole development process a lot more um, sustainable in the sense that, you know, you can eventually use that config parsing module in another project. And if you just bring over that whole test suite, you're, you're gonna have a pretty good idea of, um, well, you know, you're gonna, ha gonna be able to put a lot of trust into it. And um, so I think that pays dividends, but you know, in the end, uh, it's, it's totally up to you if you wanna go down that route. Um, do check out PyTest, I'm a huge fan of that. And uh, admittedly, this was a little bit more challenging to test because we were actually access accessing a file um, here. So, you know, normally you wouldn't have to have to deal with all of this craziness, but we would kind of focus on simple assert statements just to make sure your your uh, functions work um, the way you want them to. And, um, you know, if you want to go deeper into this, I would actually recommend that you try and do similar things with uh, the rest of your code, right? Like try and break it out into simple sort of self-contained chunks and then write tests for those. And I think whatever happens there, this is gonna be um, something that is gonna help you in your in your Python journey. And um, it's just gonna help you establish these, these patterns and you're gonna see stuff like that sooner then right because you're you're going to be writing these tests and, and as you're writing a new function you're going to be like oh how do i actually actually test this and this is going to create this like feedback cycle where um the need for writing good tests is actually going to influence how you write your code and usually like i believe that code that is easy to test is usually also easier to understand and, and easier to maintain so yeah look into that um it actually seems like a really cool project. It seems like a really useful thing that you've built here for for yourself, and um, it's a great sort of baseline or a great result you can build on top, and it's just kind of you know make it nicer and cleaner and, and nicer, and maybe just as an exercise uh, to to try and write the cleanest Python you can. Like I, I find that a lot of fun, so maybe you'll enjoy that too. Cool. That was a bit of a long one, so. Um, I hope this is going to be helpful. Uh, enjoy the video and talk to you soon.